anyone who has even a cursory familiarity with this channel is probably a game player of some kind, most likely, into role-playing games. This video will be on two topics, and it's taken me a while to well, have the time to film it, but also to have the desire to film it, because in part it may sound negative. I don't do rants. Uh, this may end up being you know, as close to one as you may ever see on this channel, and if that would be your reason to watch it, you might as well stop now. Two topics have been circulating off and on during uh, my time making regular YouTube videos. They both involve dice and system in some way. And ever since I've gotten involved in uh, reading like the the unusual, let's say, dice systems from Fantasy Flight Games for Star Wars and for Warhammer Fantasy, I've encountered a curious closed-mindedness. And I find it curious, although I'm I'm told that one of the hallmarks of, you know, self-identified geeks and nerds is somehow a resistance to things. Um, it's not my personal experience with people who self-identify as either of those things that, uh, that they have to draw such clear lines in the sand and say, this is what I like and it must be protected at all costs, and that is not what I like and, you know, it must be killed out with fire or something dramatic like that. I don't get it. I don't buy into it. So this video is about dice fools, how they relate to systems. It's about dice. Let's begin. I think the best place to start is really to say I own a ridiculous amount of dice. And out of this ridiculous amount of dice, I own none that have no symbols on them. While I have looked at a few places online where you can buy completely blank dice, I never have. So every single die that I have has a symbol on it. And I'll show you an example right now. I will pick up the iconic die that everybody is so entranced with, it seems. This is, of course, the D20. It likely won't focus very well, but this is the D20. Hooray. It has 20 faces. Every face has a symbol on it. Yes, this is a numerical symbol, but a 1 and a 0 together doesn't signify 10 for any other reason than we say that it does. It's a symbol. So, having gotten that out of the way, if I can learn that a 1 and a 0 together is the equivalent of 10, and then associate the equivalent of 10 with some kind of result connected to my system, I can certainly figure out that this pointy thing has a meaning, and that meaning is connected to something in my system. In fact, this is even easier than that 10, because around the table, 10 might be a success for him, a failure for her, failure for him, success for him, and, you know, he can't even make the roll because of some kind of restriction. That is always a failure. No ifs, ands, or buts. Okay. Now, there are lots of different kinds of dice, and as we entered into the hobby for the first time, I ask you to cast your mind back to the very first day you sat down and were shown the dice that go with a lot of games. You know, the standard polyhedrals and did you automatically know what they all were? And could you instantly recognize each of their shapes? And did you never have any trouble pulling out the right size die from the pile on the table? Did you never have anyone at the table who hesitated for a moment between identifying visually a D10 and a D8 or, you know, wondering if that really was a D12 or maybe they were making a mistake and they had to turn it around in their hands a few times just to verify, right? So, you know, if I show you these, you'll know automatically that these are D6s. They're cubes. They've got six sides. They're D6s. Well, except that they're not. Now, if I have two of them, it's the same as rolling 2D6. It's exactly the same as rolling these two bone-shaped D6, which are numbered on their six faces from 1 to 6. And this would be 2D6 and be able to produce a result of 2 to 12. 
this cube only goes to four, and this one doesn't go down, well, it doesn't have any twos on it, but it goes up to eight. This one's got a ton of twos on it. Rolled together, it's exactly the same as 2d6. The blue one and the green one rolled together, so there's no cheating. This, look, there's an 8. Produces the same, exact same, indistinguishably, the exact same results as rolling 2d6. So in combination, it's the equivalent of 2d6. I'll say that again. It's the equivalent of rolling 2d6. But there are some things that this cannot do that this set of two can. Well, and there's one right there. It's very, very unlikely for this set of dice, right, to do what I'm showing here, to roll doubles, right? Now, it can do it for ones, right? There they are. But on every other combination of faces, the dice are different. So, if I were playing a system that gave me some kind of special effect for doubles, I'm pretty much SOL if I'm using these. Okay. Now there are some games that aren't satisfied with the what was now the traditional, after 40 years, set of standard polyhedrals, the D4, the D6, the D8, the D10, the D12, the D20. There are a lot more dice than that. I mean, just sitting on my desk right now, I've got a D24. I have a D22. I have a D14. Well, this is the D14. Sorry, this is the D18. See, even now, there's sometimes trouble. I've got a D5 sitting on my desk, one of several types of D5. I have a D16, which has this terrible shape and I'm really looking forward to a Kickstarter which is going to deliver me a round D16 which will be so much better. There are D10s of course. There are D10s that have a 1 to 0 on them. 0 being 10. How do you know that 0 means 10 and not 0? Is it because somebody told you and you had to learn that? Hmm, I wonder. And then of course there's this kind of D10 which, you know, marks off the tens digit and that's pretty fabulous and you roll these together of course there are some people who swear that you should never ever roll percent unless one of the dice is a different color and that you state clearly which ones will be the tens digit of course that becomes completely unnecessary if you have the right tools for the job but the right tool for the job might actually be rolling a d100 or not because you know some of us have d100s that never ever stop rolling and once they hit the table it's just you never see it again Dice. There was a point in time where you did not know how to use them. There was a point after that where you did know how to use them, and it's about that simple. So, saying that this is intrinsically, fundamentally, or in any other way harder than this, I'm sorry, is a specious argument, and we should be beyond it by now, especially after 40 years of using this. That's the dice part. Of this video. Before we get into the system part of the video, let's take a brief detour into the proprietary aspect of things. There was a time when, if you were a Dungeons and Dragons player, you used little pieces of cardboard. You actually couldn't buy dice anywhere. And then, if you were going to use dice, you pretty much had to get them in the set, and they were crap. You know, they were so cheaply produced, they were crap. Of course, people have a lot of nostalgic atten uh, attachment to them, and I myself wish I had a set. I don't. But, you know, things change over time, and then there were game stores. And you could go into a game store, and you could buy a set of dice as easily as you could buy anything else. And that's really, really cool. And then somehow they became traditional, you know. This is what a set of dice is. I've got box sets on my shelves where, for the same system, the company is giving you completely different dice. Right. Their perception of what was required or what was traditional, well, it hadn't set itself into stone yet. The whole proprietary thing, well, okay. If you want to play a game, you got to buy dice. Well, this was just as true of, of Dungeons & Dragons 
as you know it's becoming for other games if you want to play dungeon crawl classics and you want to have an easy and fun time but you'll want to use the dice chain which means things like d14s or d16s or d7s yeah. is that so bad when you compare it to things like golf martial arts bowling role-playing games are still cheaper and why not pioneer new ways to do things you know, may have noticed this is red okay so not only is it a particular shape it's a d12 all right not only is it a particular shape it's color coded it's so much faster to teach somebody to recognize pick up the red one rather than pick up the 12-sided one it boggles my mind that no one has approached using color to identify the dice before now and I have vague recollections that all the dice used to be different colors before we got into the idea of matched dice sets so maybe it was an idea that we used to have that we've drifted away from a war game that I have called Leviathans was the first one in recent memory that I've seen that capitalized on the idea of using color to separate its die types now it uses all d12s right now they're all numbered differently and they the symbol that they use is numbers but a d black is not the same as a d red in terms of the results gained it's very very easy to identify visually same holds true for these narrative dice the red ones and the purple ones having a negative result and we know how they are applied the blue ones having a specific use the black ones having a specific use we learned how to identify colors pretty easy in life and it's a helpful tool to use in organizing our Gaming tool. Now, the dice shown here, the top row from Leviathans, the bottom row standard polyhedrals from Q Workshop. If you had a novice who'd never seen role-playing dice before, which one would be easier to tell them to pick up? Tools to targets, the right tool for the job, that sort of thing. So, if there's a game out there that you like and it comes with interesting dice, are you being ripped off? Possibly. It's possible. Right? They could be made out of gold and you'd be overcharged when they could have been made out of plastic. Or the game designer could be trying something new. They could be taking the hobby in a direction it hasn't gone before. They may have stumbled across something that we all do around the table and developed a better tool to make that happen. This tool, this is just for fun. Right? It's a mental exercise. It doesn't really accomplish anything that this doesn't and in fact it prevents you from doing some of the things that this does is this a good tool if my purpose is to amuse fellow battletech players this is great otherwise i have no real use for it this generates results from 2 to 12 right this generates results from 1 to 6 that's what it's for that's what it does and it's great at doing it I could use a 12-sided die and cut it in half and do the same job. I could get a 12-sided die that's numbered from 1 to 6 twice and it'll do the same job, but it'll roll a lot farther than this will and on and on and on. We can argue about this sort of stuff all day. It comes down to preference more often than not, and preferences are like opinions, and opinions are like that certain anatomical part that so many people seem to like talking about or comparing other people to. We've all got one. So let's get on to system. Long, long ago, when the dews of creation were still wet upon the earth, those who provided role-playing games for us were kind of excited about randomness. Right? Now we've had on again, off again, love affairs with randomness as the hobby has developed, but the use of randomizing dice or cards or whatever has stayed with us. And almost at random, it seems, funnily enough, the initial system for Dungeons & Dragons and other games of its era did seem to approach, what can I use this die for? Let's have a table that has, you know, 1d8 results. And let's have a table right next to it on the same page, which has 1d10 results. And, of course, everyone loves a list of d100. Of course, there's the d30. We love d30 lists and on and on and on. What dice were used sometimes just felt like preference. It felt as random as the results they're supposed to return. As 
game players became game designers, their own reaction to how these systems manifested caused changes. As early designers got more experienced, we saw changes. And we saw pretty early on, actually, the first dice pool game. That used D6s, the most easily obtained uh, individual die from our pantheon of dice gods. And instead of just rolling one and identifying what the number was, you rolled more than one, which, oddly enough, was fun for a lot of people. It was fun to have a, that sound, right? It's more fun, seemingly, to roll two dice instead of one die. It's more fun to roll three instead of two or five or a handful you can barely hold and see them scatter across the table and then lean breathlessly over them as you look for successes. Is it difficult to look for successes? Strangely, I'm baffled by the number of people who come forward and say it's easier to roll a single die against a target number than to roll a, a die pool. And well, okay, maybe for some people it is harder. You know, I've met people that have difficulty reading a d20 or a difficulty remembering what modifiers to add in which situations or where they should be looking on their character sheet to find those modifiers even after years and years of play. And I've also seen people who are seemingly able to pick out all of the successes across the table just from a glance and remember it, you know. We're not all the same. We are built differently. We have different talents, different interests, and more relevantly, different preferences. Preference is so often the rallying cry of argument in our community of gamers that it's a wonder we can ever find anybody to play with at all. How did we become, as a group, so close-minded that you will not try a system because it uses multiples of these instead of a single one of these. Can that really be a reason not to try a game? It's all right not to like something. It's all right to be able to identify at a distance that you're not going to like something. It's more than all right. It is your right. You have the right not to like something. But you have to have a reason. That's what separates us from purely instinctual beings who stamp their foot and demand what they want. Right? You have to have a reason not to like something. If you can't field a reason, if it's just, I don't think I'm going to like it, then you are denying yourself the opportunity to explore something that could be just as cool and just as engaging as that first role-playing game you talked about. I'm not putting myself on a pedestal here. My mother's got this great story of how when I was a very young child, she had to chase me around the dining room table in order to feed me what has become my favorite dessert of all time. It's incomprehensible to me now that she would ever need to do this. I dream about that dessert from time to time. If you follow me on G+, you'll know I often post or talk about food items that catch my interest. But she did. I had to learn to experiment. Now we all get pushed to different degrees to learn to experiment as children about different things, and we also learn how to identify things which are dangerous. Somebody showed you how to enter the world of the role-playing game. And if you've come this far to be talking to people in a community of gamers scattered all around the world, if you're going out on YouTube to explore different opinions about the hobby that you enjoy, and yet you're hanging on to the idea of the one true game, the one true way, the one true die, how much of the real hobby are you denying yourself? I'm not saying that everyone should approach role-playing games like I do. That would be completely antithetical to the purpose of this video. I explore a very large number of games, and there are people out there 
who have the time or the financial resources or the interest to explore even more. And there are people out there who have those same appetites, yet they're also creating games. We're all very, very different. I do think, though, that the knee-jerk reaction to, I'm not going to try it because it's not like what I do now. I feel this only hurts you. If you've only ever played one game, what are you waiting for? What is holding you back? There are thousands, literal thousands of games out there, and it's statistically improbable that you won't like some of them. Some of them are going to use mechanics that you have no experience with. The game you're playing now initially had mechanics you were not familiar with playing with. It's not a reason not to try. At one point in your life, you did not own any dice. You had to buy some. Some games in the future may ask you to buy some dice. There are some people, some of whom you may game with now, that feel this compulsion to buy new dice every time they play a new game or a new character, or for every role. So what? Try. The benefits far outweigh any minor potential risks. You will understand the game that you're playing now better. You may come to find what it does for you to be even sweeter after experiencing the different ways other games handle things. You may find that you become better at running it, better at playing it. You may find that the skills that you're bringing from the game that you like really make the other players in the new game that you're trying impressed. And that your very presence there creates this synergy of action that gives you one of those reasons why we play in the first place, the awesome story. The knee-jerk reaction is what this video is in opposition to. Not trying dipole mechanics because you're used to rolling a single die. I question that position. Not trying games that dare to use a familiar tool in a new way. I question that position. If you're going to hold a position, if you're going to push it out publicly, I suggest having a reason. A well-founded reason is not an unreasonable request from your audience. If you've come this far, thank you very much for listening.